was met when I pulled in with a, you know, some scowling faces. Uh, and so being a journalist, uh, wander over and ask them why they're there. Uh, and it turns out this group, they call themselves the Friends of Forest, uh, had spent really the better part of two decades uh, fighting about this monument of forest that they had put up. Um, then that monument was stolen. Another fight about whether they would be able to put up a replacement monument. Um, they, had won, they had just won that fight in federal court. And so they were out there that day to sort of prepare the grounds of this Confederate cemetery so that they could rededicate uh, this statue of forest. Uh, and and, and the, the juxtaposition, the, the dissonance of, of that experience, being there for the 50th anniversary of, a, you know, the sort of climax of the civil rights movement uh, and, and having a strange encounter with uh, these neo-Confederates gave me whiplash. And I became really fascinated with Forrest, wondering about who he was, asking questions about what it meant to put up a monument to him in 2015. Um, and, and, and so I was starting to poke around that story a little bit. Uh, the new statue goes up, and just a couple weeks later, Dylan Roof murders uh, nine parishioners of Mother Emanuel AME in Charleston, South Carolina. And in the wake of that, um, protests across the country really break out, and there's a referendum on Confederate imagery, the flag, uh, and Confederate monuments, things that bear the name of uh, Confederate leaders. Uh, and so because of this really strange encounter that I had had just before, uh, I start to follow the, some of the campaigns um, aimed at Forrest specifically. Uh, and, and, and he was an interesting subject, uh, as many of you probably know. Um, Forrest, you can understand sort of in contrast to someone like Lee. Lee from one of the first families of Virginia, the sort of exponent of the, the Southern gentry. Um, Forrest ran counter to that. He was, a, he was you know, grew up uh, impoverished, made a fortune as a slave trader, um, served as the first Grand Wizard of the Klan after, after the war, operated a convict leasing plantation after the war as well, as an accused war criminal for the massacre at Fort Pillow. Um, so he, he has a really, he represents a sort of sharper edge of, of, of Confederate memory. Um, and there are, you know, there's a county in, in Mississippi named after him. There's a city in Arkansas, a state park in Tennessee. Um, and so there were, there were referendums everywhere, protest movements everywhere to follow. Um, I followed a, the, the, the clash in Memphis and the dramatic uh, removal of that 30-foot equestrian statue, uh, the, <laughs> the, uh, the cartoonish, grotesque statue of Forrest in South Nashville um, that was sculpted by the man who co-founded the League of the South, a group that would go on to be um, major instigators of violence in Charlottesville a couple of years ago. Um, and then uh, one of the other stories, of course, and the, the reason for us being here this evening uh, is that I followed the protest movement uh, to rename uh, Forest Hall, the ROTC building on Middle Tennessee State's campus. Um, and and there were a number of reasons for following that one. You know, I, I, there were, with so many to choose from, this book follows four stories. And, and this was one of them for, for a number of reasons. Uh, from a sort of craft writing point of view, this story made a lot of sense, partly because it was happening over the course of an academic year. So of course, storytellers know you have a nice, clear beginning, middle and end. Uh, and with it, characters like two, two of whom who are with us tonight, Joshua Pretchfield uh, and Sarah Calise. Um, and, and, and talking with Joshua gave so much insight into uh, the, the present day protest movement and, and the experience on campus that day, um, or that, not that day, but that year. Um, and Sarah, of course, providing so much insight into the deeper history of um, the school's entanglement with forest, how they've used Confederate symbols and, and symbols of forest over the years and, and, and what it meant and, and where it came from. Uh, and then, of course, you know, people on the task force that the university put together to decide if they were going to change the name or not. Um, so so it, 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 it really was a... a um, Right for a, for a story, but it but it also gave so much insight into uh, providing a way of talking about uh, a moment in America where so many campus protests were breaking out that year, um, 
an insight into the, the polarized nature of America and American politics in 2015 and 2016. Um, of course, the sort of Kafka-esque restrictions that the state of Tennessee had imposed uh, to protect Confederate symbols. Um, and then, of course, the sort of remembering and forgetting that's at work um, in our collective memory when uh, we honor someone like Forrest. And so uh, Murfreesboro and, and Middle Tennessee State offered a, an interesting case study to see what you're remembering when you honor Forrest, at least publicly, and, and what, you're, what you're forgetting, at least publicly, or, or, or neglecting to talk about um, in public. So things like the sign uh, just outside of Murfreesboro that marks the place where Forrest rested before he leads the raid in Murfreesboro in 1862. And you can look at the minutia of, of the memories of the war that want to focus on the battles. But then if you go to downtown Murfreesboro, uh, there are certainly plenty of signage talking about Forrest and his raid. There's the proud Confederate soldier there on the courthouse square. Uh, but in his eye line um, is the, what used to, the building that used to be the slave market in town. Um, but that goes unmarked. Um, and so that, that the two sides of that coin, what it means to remember the military exploits of the Confederacy, but not talk about uh, the explicit reasons that, that they had seceded and were fighting, which is to say um, the preservation and the expansion of uh, slavery and the, the lie of white supremacy that they had founded uh, that society on. I mean, you can look at the documents, Jefferson Davis, arguing that slavery is central to the Confederate project because he believed that black people were inherently inferior, stamped by their creator with that uh, inferiority. Um, so so it, it, Murfreesboro and, and the, the debate at Middle Tennessee State offered a really uh, clear and I think revealing way to talk about the Confederacy, the legacy of slavery, um, what's getting remembered and, and, and what's, getting, um, uh, what's getting sidestepped. Uh, so, so yeah, it, it was it was a it was a it was a very um, revealing reporting project, and and like I said, I'm really excited to be here to talk with you all about it, and to talk with uh, Joshua and, and Sarah, who were who were really central to um, to this to this story, um, and and have so much insight into it. So so cheers, y'all. It's good to be with you. Well, greetings, everyone. It's good to see um, some folks that I've known for a while. Good to see Dr. Woods. Good to see everybody, you know, connected to MTSU. Um, you know, I want to talk about um, kind of some of the nuts and bolts of the campaign, but also just some lessons, you know, um, that I learned uh, from that campaign. So, you know, Bree Newsom Bass, you know, she's responsible for, you know, even this campaign beginning. And I was fortunate to be in conversation with Bree and Connor last week um, and kind of let her know that, you know, she's responsible for, you know, this campaign even happening. Um, and, and also just a point to, you know, a lot of these campaigns that you see going on now, a lot of the campaigns you see happening in history, you know, Black women are responsible for leading, you know, a whole, a whole host of, you know, any freedom movements um, that we have in the past. And I, like so many others, kind of watch her climb up that pole you know, cl climb down quoting scripture and get arrested. And it was just a, a catalyst that kind of, um, that, that's, that kind of, yeah, launched this entire initiative. Um, so after watching that, um, I posted a Facebook status on Facebook, just highlighting the fact that, you know, MTSU has a building, you know, on its campus named after Forest Hall. Um, and so after posting that Facebook status, you know, I got together with a crew of folks. And, you know, at, that, at this point, it was still during the summertime. Um, it was mostly a group of white students, local community members, uh, members of the campus workers union as well, too. Um, and, you know, from the very beginning, our argument was fairly simple. You know, if you care about black people, if you care about your black students, your faculty, your staff, the area's black community, then you rename Forest Hall. Um, and just given the history of Forest Hall. Um, but we also connected um, our statements, our argument with the ongoing movement for Black Lives. And it's, it's kind of hard to remember, but, you know, the, the way we're experiencing now is really a second wave of, of an ongoing kind of movement for Black Lives, right? Um, this first movement, um, I think, was a little bit distinct. Um, it was, you know, there were less, you know, it was less diverse in, in, the, in the 
kind of the first half of this, but it was an ongoing, that was the backdrop um, of, of this campaign, the ongoing move for Black Lives. And we also connected to, you know, our argument to the long history of Black students that are already attempted to get rid of these symbols and get rid of this iconography um, on campus. Um, MTSU, as you know, we know, was like many other campuses, many other Southern schools during this time period, um, who embraced Confederate iconography, um, especially after the Brown v. Board um, decision in, in 1954. Um, and so, you know, following that decision, you know, they named their RTC building after Nathan Bedford Forrest. Um, and since, you know, Black students had arrived on the campus, they've been protesting these symbols. Um, you know, MTSU, and these are archived in the Gore Center, and we see that, you know, Black students protested there in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the early 2000s, and, and then again in the 2015s. Um, so in other words, we, you know, we knew um, that MTS, Black students on campus, students of color on campus did not appreciate this iconography on the campus. Um, so our first action, uh, we held a protest on campus and we symbolically buried Nathan Bedford Forrest um, in front of Forrest Hall. I think you can see these kind of pictures um, from this event where we made kind of a prop Nathan Bedford Forrest in a casket and, and symbolically, you know, buried him. Um, after that first action, um, Dr. McPhee did come um, and, and spoke with us and, you know, he told us that um, one, you know, they had already formed the task force and that they were going to be, you know, having some um, open forums to debate that matter. Uh, now, as an aside, I, you know, task forces are tools. You know, they're white supremacist tools. They're, they're tools they get used to stymie and stifle momentum um, and to prevent any real change around issues of white supremacy and issue, any forms of domination. So. And, and we were aware of that. We were aware of that, you know, this is a process that was designed to slow down our momentum, to keep us from, you know, pressing the issue even more. Even more. Um, in our minds, the school wanted to form a task force to debate white supremacy. And we thought that, you know, one, by participating in it, we would legitimize what we thought as a, was an illegitimate process, right? We don't think, we didn't think that there was much to debate at this point. Um, so, you know, at, at the at the first meeting, you know, we came up with a strategy that we would both engage the process and then express, you know, that it was that we thought it was illegitimate. Um, so the first meeting, uh, we basically, you know, got together with another crew of students who were also organizing. Um, while this was happening, we had another group of undergraduate black students who were also um, organizing. So we combined our efforts with them. We got our arguments together and we organized our responses. You know, we participated in the first meeting. Um, I think this one sh um, kind of highlighted at least that we weren't ignorant about these issues, right? We knew the history, but we also knew this wasn't even about history. Um, after the first um, panel, um, we ended the panel by kind of disrupting the end of the meeting and yelling the Asada chant. Um, you know, the forums we thought were um, kind of a, a big mess. Um, they were really tentious. Um, they're really combative, but, you know, it was an opportunity for us to show our dis dissatisfaction um, with this process. Um, the second form, we thought we would kind of ratchet up the pressure a little bit. Um, so the second uh, form, we interrupted it by protesting it, um, and we were escorted out by the police. Um, before the beginning of the third form, um, I think my timeline is right here. Um, we did, I published a letter um, with the local newspaper editor suggesting that black students should um, transfer from MTSU um, to HBCUs. Um, now, you know, the reason behind this was one, you know, I felt that we should not be no longer begging. We shouldn't be begging for this. And at what point does begging begin to diminish your own sense of being, right? Um, two, recognize that the MTSU, black, black students at MTSU, students of color at MTSU make up a considerable, you know, majority of the school. Um, and just as a strategy to threaten the school, right? What would it mean if your students pulled out and went to a different school? I and mean, that would threaten, you know, the school's bottom line. Um, so yeah, so I published, I published a letter. Um, uh, we had a third forum. After the third forum, we, we marched to the president's house. Again, we're, we're just, we're trying to express our discontent with this process. We're agitating 
Uh, we're, we're taking methods from previous movements and uh, dramatizing, you know, the issue here. Um, so we marched to President McPhee's house. Um, and after all this, right, this, this is a year long process. Um, the task force did decide to recommend a name change. Um, their recommendation um, was then sent to the State Historical Commission and they decided not to change the name. Um, and, you know, one, this points back to, you know, the, the process of creating task force. You know, if you look at the makeup of the task force, and somebody didn't mention last week to Connor, but you look up the, you know, who made it the task force. Um, one of the people who wrote, the co-authored the Tennessee Heritage Law that made it harder to, to get these things changed was on the task force. And so you know, the process was set up for us to fail, you know, really from the beginning. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, I did learn some lessons in this. I think, you know, this, this left me thinking, you know, is this something that Black folks should be gaining, should be working on, right? Is, is taking down white supremacists, monuments, iconography, something that Black folks should spend their energy um, working on? Or is it a white problem, right? Is it something that white, white folks should, you know, really just kind of dig into um, and work on? So I, I question that a lot. Um, you know, through this process, I saw, you know, students, mostly Black students, getting called the N-word, getting called dumb, getting called derogatory terms. You know, I myself, you know, experienced like kind of mental health crises during these times, right? I'm supposed to be in school. I'm supposed to be getting, you know, trying to get my, get my education, but I'm having to deal with this. You know, I felt like students were taking on the responsibility of something that the institution should lead in changing, but also realizing that institutions won't lead <laughs> in changing these things, and it's going to have to be um, other folks. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of left the campaign wondering, you know, is this Black work? Um, I, and I don't necessarily see it the same way now. Um, you know, I think we do, we wage struggle against white supremacy, we wage struggle against oppression, um, in both the symbolic and the material, right? These things are connected. You know, the presence of a forest hall um, on campus points us to other directions in our society, right? The presence of Forest Hall on campus points us to the, the afterlives of slavery, the afterlives of Jim Crow, the ongoing, you know, ness of you know racial capitalism. And so I think that, you know, if we're gonna work on the symbolic level, we have to make connections to how these impact us, how these have material weight in our lives. Um, and in the same way, you know, if we're working on the, ma the material conditions, we have to connect them to how these symbolic forces um, um, how they how they held up in our lives as well too. So after, with that, I'll pass it to Sarah. All right, thank you so much to Josh and Connor. Uh, thank you for being here. I was thinking earlier today, the last time MTSU had a a large public meeting about this, and I think it was October 2018, when we hosted the Movement 68 Symposium, and we brought back, as Josh mentioned, all those generations from, I think we brought back one activist from each generation, from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2010s, and then current. And it was a great two-hour event where probably really for the first time, those black students got to like air their grievances in public about MTSU and their time here. Um, so I appreciate us revisiting this history because it's something that we have to keep revisiting. We have to keep confronting this. Forest Hall is still there. I can see it from my window right now. Uh, I pass by it every day. So, so yeah, I'm just really glad that everyone's here conversation and continuing to talk about these issues because they're not going away anytime soon. Um, I want to start off actually with something that Josh just brought up and this this can be a question to both it's kind of more towards Connor but and Josh will understand why once I get into it but Josh talks about is this a white problem or is this a black person's problem or is it both really it's probably both um, in my opinion but the reason that I, as a white person on this campus, 
started the Forest Hall protest collection. The reason I started documenting the current movement that was happening in 2015, and then really going back into our archives and digging up everything I could find, any Confederate flag that appeared in a yearbook, any time the forest mascot appeared, you know, I was, I was just scanning all those little instances. The reason I built that collection is because I felt as a white person, as a white archivist, as a white public historian on this campus, it was probably easier and safer for me to talk about these controversial issues on this campus and not have the same repercussions that my black and brown colleagues at MTSU probably would have. Um, so yeah, I, my question is to Connor specifically, and Josh can weigh in too, um, Connor, you talk about in the book, and I think this is one of the greatest parts about the book, your own struggle with your whiteness in terms of all these stories and how you kind of talk about this internal, how, for, how, how these forest monuments relate to you too. You didn't think they did at first, but then you realize, you know, wait, like, they're putting these monuments up in my name too. And what does that mean? So my question is, um, can you talk about that process of your internal reflection, Connor, and how you turn something like that into outward action? Yeah, definitely. So I, I grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, you know, just north of the, the that mythical uh, Mason-Dixon line. Um, and, uh, you know, I, th I think that the sort of received wisdom growing up was, you know, race was a problem for Black people and, you know, brave men like Martin Luther King stood up and marched and, you know, helped us get past that. Um, and, you know, insofar as it's still a problem, it's really just, you know, kind of a problem down there. Um, convenient, uh, convenient way to think about it. Um, but just, you know, uh, as naive as can be, I think. Um, and, and so over the course of, of this project, you know, reporting in four different cities, trying to, trying to, take the scope of, of, of really centuries of, of American history that's fooled out in both directions from the Civil War, you know, I really started to see that, uh, yes, the Union victory in, uh, in the Civil War the, led to the emancipation of slaves, but it, it did nothing to combat the, the ideology that was underpinning it, that, that white Americans North and South were using to justify this this tilted board, the the, the lie of white supremacy that, you know, that, that black Americans were inherently inferior. And so we could sort of cope with the 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 moral bankruptcy of a institution like slavery. But and and so digging into it, I come to see, you know, um, even though I wanna I wanna affiliate myself with the Union Army, really coming to see all of the wealth that is generated from the slave system enriching Northerners. Um, you know, and, and how that system continues to, um, to play out long past the Civil War. You know, we live in a country that has a 10 to 1 racial wealth gap. Uh, the coronavirus exposing the, uh, you know, the, the um, disproportionate toll that it's taking on, on Black Americans exposing inequities in our healthcare system. Um, and then prompting me and, and prompting me to think about the ways that race shapes my life. You know, again, it's sort of the received wisdom is that, you know, whiteness is just a sort of default or the, the, the kind of room tone of American life. And we're not encouraged to think about the way that race shapes our life. But, you know, in everything from the way that you get a mortgage for your house to the way that your school is zoned and funded, um, you know, race had, had, had everything to do with how I move through the world and, and the lines on which, you know, I've, I've, I've built my life. Um, and so, so yeah, this, this project was a, a really a, a arc of coming closer to forest. I think I, when I started reporting this book, I thought, one, that I could sort of be exempt from it, that I had this sort of outsider status. Um, I was a white northerner. I was a good white northerner. Um, and, and I could sort of just be the sort of third person observer, neutral journalist. Um, but, but the, the more that I came to see how, uh, you know, in, in every facet of our lives, 
this construction of whiteness, a way of hoarding resources, wealth, opportunity at the expense of, uh, of people of color was meant that I had a stake in it too. And so if I was going to write this book, I was going to write about Boris, I was going to write about the legacy of white supremacy, I was going to have to write about myself too. Yeah, definitely. Like, I definitely relate to everything that you said, too. Um, I think building the Forest Hall Protest Collection really made me think about my own whiteness more than I ever had before. I grew up in Florida, which, depending on who you are, is the South or not, um, I would say it's the South. <laughs> and I had never heard of Nathan Bedford Forrest either until I moved to Tennessee. And then mm -hmm. once, once I knew who he was, it's like I couldn't stop seeing him. Um, and he almost like haunts you in a way. Uh, unfortunately. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and then my experience in 2015-2016 really just drove home that, for me, as I continue in my work here at MTSU, that this is something I can never stop talking about as a white person on this campus. Um, even if they take it down, we're the archive, what we do is history, you know, we're going to continue to talk about it, because that is part of this, this uh, campus's past, and it's not something that needs to be hidden or or, you know, put away just because the building's gone. Because I think, as Josh alludes to, you can take down symbols, but the structures are still there. Um, anyways, I'd like to move on to another question for both of you. That's kind of, we're gonna zoom back out to just America in general. Um, the word reckoning you use in the title of the book, and that's a word that I've seen a lot used for discussing these, this white supremacist history and Confederate memorials. Um, so I just wanted to ask in both of your opinion, what does it mean or even look like for America to finally reckon with this white supremacist history? Is it possible? Are there other models that we could look to? Um, I, I immediately think of Germany who banned Nazi symbols after World War II, and then South Africa has a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Is anything like that even possible in your mind right now for America? Well, I'll go. Um, first, you know, you know, the history of the Confederacy, it's easy for Americans to think about the Confederacy and not see themselves, right? It's easy for folks to look at the Confederacy and not see it as a legacy of America. And the and that, you know, America is a legacy of the Confederacy. It, they're tied together. The American flag and the Confederate flag are ultimately tied together. And so on one hand, you know, the Confederacy allows us to kind of see a kind of overt history that the losing side kind of, I guess, right? And, and, and make judgments about that but it also stops us from really engaging with the problematic reckoning that needs to happen in America, right? Like, so what fictions continue to guide us as Americans, right? Fictions around freedom, uh, fictions around whiteness, innocence. Um, you know, like we have a Supreme Court, you know, nomination going on right now. And the judge is talking about, you know, standards of objectivity, of, you know, of constitutionality, of reading a racist document, right? <laughs> and so, like, we have to begin to reckon with the root of America is racist, right? The root of America is rooted in racial capitalism, and that's gendered, you know, that, that you know, that it, they uphold these forms of, of oppression, and it, it's at the root of America. And so we can't have that honest conversation then there is no reckoning, right? And I, and I mentioned this earlier, you know, if we see a Confederate monument, a Confederate statue, a Confederate building, it should point us to America. And the existence of prisons in America kind of points us to the afterlives and the unfinished, the afterlives of slavery and the unfinished work of abolition. Um, and, and so, you know, America still has these long problems that have never, ever been solved. And we're not honest about it, right? We're not honest about, about, about this history. And so where's the, when's the reckoning going to happen? And we, we got we to, gotta, you know, the pandemic has exposed myths about so-called individual liberties that America says they give us, right? And these individual liberties fail to protect 
black and brown po people historically and now and now you see that you see that you see you see how individual rights during the pandemic you know have failed <laughs> to protect vulnerable people that have historically been vulnerable and so we got to we got to ask ourselves what are what are these myths about freedom and liberty and justice that were created when people were unfree, right? That when women were unfree, when black folks were unfree, when indigenous folks were getting kicked out the land, if we still live, all live on stolen land, right? We, we're not willing to have those conversations. And it's easy, it's easier for us to pin it on the Confederacy and, the, and, and pretend like it's a problem that's a strictly a historical moment, right? It, it's a problem that's strictly in the past. As long as we continue to, even as historians, think about it, as a problem that's in the past and not, we're not still living in those afterlives right now, right? We're not still living in, like, like we're not still living in an age of mass incarceration um, and, and, and with, with a white backlash to, to Obama, right? We're not, we're not still living in, in those times. And so we won't, we won't have a reckoning <laughs> until we can be honest uh, about that kind of history. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would only add to that, um, you know, it, it might be useful to think about a reckoning, you know, as it comes to us from uh, accounting, you know, like to actually to, to reckon the, the cost of something. And so for, for a reckoning in America to happen, we might look at the massive amounts of wealth that are extracted to say nothing of the physical and spiritual torture of slavery, but the, the, the financial theft that happened um, over the course of the, the you know, uh, first half of the 19th century as modern American capitalism is built through slavery, mortgages, speculations, you know, the, 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 the instruments of capitalism that are still with us are developed to extract the most wealth from enslaved people as possible. Um, and then after that, you look at who is included or excluded from the Homestead Act, from the Social Security Act, uh, from FHA loans, from the GI Bill, who is who's who targeted for predatory loans leading up to the 2008 financial crisis? I mean, just at every turn, race is used as a way of hoarding wealth, opportunity, uh, resources. As Joshua points out, land. I mean, just the like the 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 material truths <laughs> of American life break down along racial lines because it is this instrument of exploitation. I mean, it, it because there is no like there's no biological fact of race. It is it is a it is a political term in the sense of how power is organized. It's this sort of confederacy of pale-skinned Europeans who are coming together, and that is going to shift over time. But the the central bargain is the same. We're gonna we're gonna give ourselves what Du Bois called the wages of whiteness, um, and 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 betray the ideals of a free and open democracy that we that we you know pray to, but never really um, live up to. Um, so yeah, I mean that's 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 the reckoning, and that would be huge. I mean to to address that, to address even one component of that, say housing, um, which is which is you know Tanahasi Coates in his famous essay, the the case for reparations, can make the case for reparations only on housing, right? Um, that would that I mean that is a massive massive redistribution of wealth, a massive reorganization of our society, uh, sorely needed one, but but the the you know a, a daunting task nonetheless. Um, so how do you do that? And I think Josh was absolutely right. Like being on, just like squaring up to and being honest about where all of this came from, the lies that we've told ourselves about what this nation does, who it affords opportunities, freedoms, liberties to, and, and who it, it holds them from and what the consequence of that is. So, so yeah, I think if we want that reckoning, we need to come to a common understanding uh, of our past and its consequences on our on our present. Um, so so things like this. So th I think that's when the symbolic becomes really important, right? Because there are opportunities to stage that um, that referendum on our history and get maybe <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, it's it fits and starts, um, but get closer to a common understanding of that past. And it's it's hard, Connor. Even like if you look at like our current like political kind of landscape right now, right? It seems like regardless of your political persuasion, right? You're not engaged in this real reckoning. You're engaged in symbolic yeah. reckoning, right? 
you know, a movement pops up, you know, black folks, we get, we see now more videos of black folks getting killed by the police. And what do we have, you know, in Congress, we have, you know, fake gestures of kneeling and like <laughs> African kente cloth, you know, in place of real substantial like engagement with the issues. But the problem with that is, you know, if folks in power, regardless of your political persuasion, right, if you're a liberal or conservative, you have a vested interest in not shaking up the status quo and not really questioning, you know, or having that reckoning that's going to destabilize your power position and, and, and authority, right? And so that's why you have a candidate like Donald Trump, who's a law and order candidate, and you have a candidate like Joe Biden, who's a law and order candidate, who's talking about giving $300 million more dollars to the police, right? And so where does that, how does this reckoning happen, right? And that, you know, that's my question. And you, know, you have to waver between, you know, like, I don't know, a, a tightrope of hope, you know, I don't know, I don't know. Um, yeah, I think you perfectly set me up for my next question, Josh, actually, um, which is about hope. Uh, Connor and Josh, both you mentioned in the book, Josh, in your interviews for the book, and Connor in your narration, that you go back and forth between having hope and losing hope in this process, um, between optimism and pessimism. Is hope a conscious strategy for these movements? Is it something, is having hope something you can learn? Josh, no. you want to take that first? Yeah, you know, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, um, she wrote the book Golden Gulag. You all should read it about prisons. Um, but she calls hope a discipline, right? It's something that you have to foster, something that you have to practice, something that you have to wake up every single day and engage in it, right? And, you know, I've always said that, you know, I find my hope in, like, the people doing the work, right? It won't be in the institutions. It certainly won't be in this country. It won't be in a, in, in a school, right? It's got to be in the people that are doing the work. And if you have two or three people, it's always going to be a small number. And for me, that, that's that's where the hope has got to lie. And I got to believe, you know, I got to believe to get through this day and to get through tomorrow that, you know, we go, we're going to win this in the end. And so that's, that's my hope. It has to come from the people. Yeah, I, I, for a long time while I was working on this book, I was kind of driving myself crazy, swinging back and forth between having hope and, and, and not having hope, you know, I, I would come out of a, a, a conversation with Joshua and be like, okay, yeah, what is <laughs> great? I mean, you know, but well, then, but, really <laughs> but then, you know, uh, whatever the historical commission votes against MTSU or votes against the city of Memphis or, you know, Heather Heyer is killed in the streets of Charlottesville, you know, what, like swinging back and forth between these two. And, and I, I, I don't know. I, I, I really like what Josh was saying about hope. And I, I feel like I need to maybe reevaluate the stance that I kind of landed on. Um, but I, I kind of try to stop thinking about it in terms of, of hope or, or despair, partly because of just like the enormity of the work before us. Um, and the fact that I think we really find ourselves in a kind of 11th hour <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, even just like time on this planet to address uh, the, uh, the massive inequities of this country and the, the violence that underpins those inequities. Um, and so I, I, I came to kind of feel like I got to get over this, like taking everything as a referendum on hope or, or despair or reason to be optimistic or, or cynical and just kind of like keep keep both eyes on the, on the, the, the work ahead. Um, but I, I, I think, I think Josh makes a great point, which is that like <laughs> that work ahead is hard um, and incredibly challenging, draining. And that's even, you know, as someone who isn't rem like, who can sort of do it because I choose to do it and I'm not constantly being sort of insulted or dehumanized as I do it or gaslit. Um, but but it's so but but to to show up to continue to show up to do it with with discipline and regularity and with 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 a, this sort of fearsomeness that the moment asks of us, I, yeah maybe I do need to find a way to just like keep hope and 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 stay in a, in a deeper way I, maybe being too wishy washy about it. Oh, I totally relate though, Connor. I think um, since 2015, I've been in this like pendulum swing as well. You know. I'd get really amped up after hearing Josh speak at a protest 
or just hearing him speak in class. We were in class together during those protests. Um, he sat across from me in Dr. Lewis Wood's class, and I would just get really inspired, and I was like, no, like, we can do this. We're going to win, and then something bad would happen, or, um, you know, just hearing, sitting in those forums was such, like, its own little mental health trauma, and you come out of those so drained and exhausted, and you're like, we're never going to get anywhere in this mm. state with these laws, with these people. Um, but like Josh, people like Josh would give me hope. Um, and I think I just had to finally just realize you have to come to work every day and chip away at these things and, and do what I could do, you know? So part of like building the Forest Hall protest collection, you know, I'm trained as an archivist. How can I use my archive skills for this movement? Mm. How can, what, what can I, what specifically can I do every day to like slowly chip away at these systems and these symbols? Um, and that's kind of how I just had I've had to think about it. I still swing between optimism and pessimism sometimes. I'm naturally a pessimistic person, but um, when I when I can actively do something that does make me feel like I'm helping in some way, and that gives me some more internal hope. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that also. Yeah, I think that we needed to take away some of the like responsibility everybody's putting on their individual selves, right? We're mm -hmm. not gonna individually, <laughs> we're not gonna individually do the work that move, it takes movements to do, right? Um, that, that's not, that, that doesn't bear out in history that it's been individuals. We, 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 put, we give individuals monuments, right? <laughs> but, but that's not how they happen, right? Movements are people, right? Movements are a lot of people picking it up and putting it down, right? And so, you look at it that way you know we're just picking it up for a little while and we'll put it down you know we're not the, we're not the ones that are going to carry it the entire way we're just picking up for a little bit and so you know for me you know history has always been both like what's made me depressed enough but also what's inspired me right like the depressing part is like that these systems seem totalizing uh, but the part that inspires you is that they're not right they're, they're not totalizing systems and you've seen if you look at the history how people have 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 uh, have formed lives, meaningful lives, and you know, with these systems in place, people have fought back against these systems with them in place, and you know, and it's not totalizing. You know, it, it may kill someone, but it ain't gonna kill us all, right? Yeah, no, one hundred percent. I mean, like, yeah, the depressing part is that Forest Hall has been here for over fifty years, and Black students have fought against it over fifty years. But the inspiring part is that it was always just a few. 60s, 70s, 80s, it was always just, it wasn't like every black student wasn't involved, they didn't have to be, it wasn't, you know, it's not their issue, um, they just trying to get through college, like, <laughs> like you were, um, but it was always a small group that has just kept this going at MTSU for 50 plus years now, and that is the inspiring part, for sure, um, and it continues, you know, we, we, every, it's a sporadic movement, but it's never stopped, and I think that's what's really hopeful. We just had our last protest here over the summer after George Floyd was murdered. The students marched to Forest Hall once again. So the work continues and that's, and that's what, there's always someone there to pick it up and that's what's inspiring. Um, we're winding down here. So I really wanted to get this question in because I know there are some black students um, here attending who might want to start challenging these systems again like you did josh so you are now in my eyes as the archivist and historian here considered a veteran of the movements of mtsu uh, <laughs> i survived you did so like others before you because i know um when you were protesting andre canty who was a protester in 2006 joined and kind of gave you guys some advice um i don't know if sylvester brooks ever got in touch with you I know he got in touch with Andre Canty. So there's just been this history of previous uh, Black students helping the current and future generation. So what advice would you give for current or future Black students at MTSU who might want to challenge this institution's structural racism and its symbols that are still up? Yeah, um, you know, tackling, and this is a lesson too, tackling, you know, Forest Hall or MTSU's campus is really a state of Tennessee issue, right? And the state of Tennessee has one of the most oppressive legislative bodies in this country. 
you know, oppressive against women, oppressive against black folks. They passed a law that would send pro what would, would uh, give protesters a felony, right, for protesting, <laughs> you know, the statues out there. And so, you know, into this is really an issue that needs to be pressed. I think um, at the state level, um, but it's problem. You know, there's power at the state level, right? Like, you know. Um, um, Mayor Ketron now, right, who was on the task force that co-wrote the, you know, the, the heritage law that made it harder, he's now the mayor of Rutherford County. And so this is how power works in Tennessee, right? And so knowing that you have to come up with an argument, you know, that's going to compel folks <laughs> to see how absurd, you know, this is, you know, you don't have, a, you have your people power, but you have, you also have the power of an argument. You have the power to draw attention to the absurdity. The problem is everything in America is absurd. It doesn't, it makes little sense, right? <laughs> so you have to be able to, you know, be able to cause some disruption, be, be able to shut some shit down, <laughs> be, you know, to, to, to make people feel uncomfortable to draw attention to the issue. Now, you know, will that be successful? It's going to be in your eyes, right? Um, you know. You have to, and, and the, we have to really seek to redefine what success and failures are in these movements, right? Is success getting the getting the name changed? Yeah, but also success is you know waking up the critical consciousness of a campus uh, of the folks you're doing this work with as well too, who ultimately you know take that what's been developed, what you learned, you know, on the ground protesting, what you learn, you know, face to face with power, other places, and do it other places, which is ultimately how we crack this crack this system, right? So. Yeah, I like that. Um, I would say as a white person on this campus who was a student at the time in 2015, and I just remember being really angry because I knew there were more white people on this campus that agreed with us, that were on our side, than that showed up, whether physically or, or emotionally to us as students going through that movement or wrote a letter or anything. So I would just like to end by saying, speaking directly to the white staff and faculty on this campus that if you are aware that this is a problem, that you are seeing the injustices on campus, that we need to start speaking out more. It should not be on the onus of these students time after time again, whether it's getting Forest Hall renamed or um, you know, increasing the equality on campus for black students, but dis disabled students were the ones to push for curb cuts on campus and ramps. Um, the queer students here were the ones to push for gender orientation and sexual, or gender identity and sexual orientation. Why is it always the students that have to push for these things? So I'm just would like to give a direct statement to the staff and faculty here, especially the tenured faculty um, and people in higher power who are aware that there's things wrong on this campus who just haven't spoken up yet. I think it's time for us to start getting comfortable with being uncomfortable and talking about these issues to our fellow white people and those who are the oppressors. Um, with that, we got five minutes left. Connor, Josh, you have anything you want to wrap up with? Last statements? Anything? Um, Connor, listen, you, you're good. But, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think I just want to you know, Sarah, you said, talked about getting uncomfortable. And I think, you know, our goal, my goal, right? And a lot of folks that I, that, that I co-labor with is to create a new world, right? <laughs> and so that's going to take a lot of getting, you know, uncomfortable. You know, I want to deal with the legacies, you know, of slavery, the legacies of Jim Crow. And to me, that's you know you deal with pri the prisons the prisons are like are, are like the legacies right um and you know what does it mean you know to fight against white supremacy right now and i think that means you know really thinking about an abolitionist future where we don't have folks locked up in cages mostly black and brown folks and low-income folks locked up in cages um, and so I'm going to die on this hill, right? <laughs> Anytime I have an opportunity to come speak about anything, I'm going to die on this hill because these are the afterlives. This is what it's going to take for us to really reckon with society, to, rec to reckon with, you know, who we call criminal is just a political term as well, too. There are folks out there <laughs> who have done horrible things that are not in jail, right? And that, and that yeah, for us to, 
to really combat this system, we really got to start, you know, doing that deep reckoning um, that we talked about earlier. Connor, anything? I think we do have a couple of questions from the audience if we want to move into that real quick. I know we're almost at time. But if, Lewis, you want to ask uh, one or two of those questions. Yes, we've had a number of people um, put questions, and I can combine some of them. Um, uh, and let me put them out in groups, and people can respond as, as they see fit. Uh, someone asked about the task force itself and wondered why uh, maybe Mr. Crutchfield could speak a little bit more about why he thought it, the, the task force itself was, was illegitimate. Um, another question was um, about scholarship, which uh, is, is always cool. Susan Neiman has a book called Learning from the Germans, Race, Memory, Race and the Memory of Evil, and the questioner wanted to know if that book was applicable to this situation. Um, someone had asked about the medallion uh, and wanted to know uh, about that, the Forest Hall medallion on the KUC building. Um, someone has also asked about, uh, a vet, an Army veteran has asked about all of the military bases named after uh, Confederate uh, generals and would like to know how do we get to the point where we can get these renamed. Um, and then um, someone asked why the building was named Forest Hall in the first place. Did he give money? Uh, someone could speak to that. And then someone asked a question about um, what faculty and leaders like myself at MTSU can do for uh, addressing some of these issues. So it's really a question to me, so I'll just briefly answer that one if, if I may. Um, uh, I've been working, I mean, one thing uh, that I did on this particular controversy was to serve as an expert at the administrative law hearing. I knew that was not going to be successful, but still, I thought it was a powerful opportunity to bear witness to the actual, uh, you know, symbols and, 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 and share with this historical commission how truly awful they were because they, they're documented in the Forest Hall database and they were awful. Uh, the other, uh, Lewis Woods and I and Van West and others are working together to get the administration, which we think hopefully will be approved, a proposal to put a series of uh, historical contextualizing signage, signs I should say, around the building itself. We're prohibited from changing the name by this uh, legislation. Okay, but there's nothing that says we can't put signs in front of it that explain who Forest really was. Uh, explain the history of protest here at MTSU and maybe make a statement about uh, the university's uh, actions uh, to, to redress this. And that, you know, I wouldn't write that, but I would, we'd like to get the money and uh, the proposal to move that forward. So um, th that's all. Those are the sets of questions about, uh, the, again, the, um, you, uh, what were the problems of the committee that made it illegitimate, um, this uh, Susan Neiman's work, uh, military bases, the uh, um, and the like. I think Josh, you want to go ahead and talk about the uh, the task force? Yeah, um, so we thought the task force was an illegitimate task force for a few reasons. One, we thought that we were debating white supremacy and we didn't think there was any need to debate white supremacy. You know, our position was that Students had debated this. This has been this had been a public discussion on campus. What what Sarah said for fifty years, um, and we understood the formation um, of a task force to just be a, basically a PR stunt. You know, we, we we didn't we didn't expect them to you know recommend a name change, honestly. But we we thought that the process would be just a PR stunt designed to kick this down the road, and again, the stymie. Um, student progress, and we didn't think that it wasn't a conversation about history, you know, the historical merits of a person. It, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was a conversation about power, really, right? It was a conversation about, you know, the power um, or how whiteness is attached to the name of Forrest and how that is just upheld in our society, right? Like, it, it's a question of power. We, it wasn't a question of history. It, it wasn't even a question of historical memory. It was just, it was about power um, in our minds. So we thought 
It was an illegitimate process. Yeah, it was, I think it also, um, the particular structure of that forum seemed uh, like it posed some challenges to, you know, the, the, I, I, I talked a little bit earlier about uh, this story being a kind of lens on polarized America and that sort of tit for tat style of the forum where people uh, pro forest would testify for three minutes or two minutes and then someone who wanted, wanted to change the name would testify and they're sort of going back and forth for uh, for hours. I mean, they, they were long, they were long meetings. Um, it, it, I think really sort of exposed this really deep rift in America, basically sort of two views of, of, of how we look at our past and, and how we trace that past into our into our present um, and, and how that breaks down along, you know, who has power and who doesn't, as, as Joshua was saying. Um, but I think, you know, well, yeah. I, so I think that, that that sort of compounded some of the issues too with the, um, with the task force. Um, yeah. yeah, it was a Donald Trump both sides. Like it was like a both sides. We want to hear both sides of the argument here. And in our minds, you know, that was that was absurd. And so sorry, Connor. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, yeah, uh, you know, it's sort of the, like, he's the most polarizing figure from the most polarizing part <laughs> of American history. It's sort of like, yeah. uh, you know, like, you couldn't focus group a better or a worse, rather, you know, way of staging an argument like that. And then to draw it out over a year. Um, but yeah, I, that's interesting though, Lewis, what you were saying about that sort of added, uh, adding that, that context to the building, because that was one of the three options on the table for the task force to deliberate about, um, to, to change the name, to remove the name, or to keep the name with, um, or, sorry, to keep the name, change the name, or keep it with, with that added context. And, and I always had wondered what it would mean to tell the truth about why that building is called what that building is called. Um, so I, 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 I'm really curious to see what y'all do with that and, 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 and what you say. I hope, you know, it, it's not an expensive job. I think it's going to, to happen. Um, some people have asked why the building Forest Hall was named Forest Hall anyway. And that's also a question, you know, did and someone said, did he give money to the university? Um, I know the answer, but uh, others maybe could answer um, uh, for us. Maybe Sarah, you could briefly just give that context. Yeah. Um, Forest Hall was named after Nathan, but technically the full name is Nathan Bedford Forest Memorial Hall. That's what it was dedicated as in 1958. And um, President Q.M. Smith, President MT, uh, MTSU President Q.M. Smith, um, about in the 40s, uh, Kiyom comes from the, you know, the that neo-confederate lost cause mythology sector of the South. He believed in a lot of those things. And so during his presidency in the 40s and 50s, he started to sprinkle forest images throughout campus, um, tying the Blue Raider name to forest, making forest hall, um, using forest image as official school logos, putting it on our newspaper, putting it on our yearbooks. So, and then the dedication speech for Forest Hall, um, I think it was Dean Keithley, I believe, who gave that dedication speech. And he says, you know, the name of Forest, his spirit already resides on our campus. And what he's alluding to when he says that are all these things that QM Smith has placed across campus in the in the couple decades that he was president, um, but other than that, there no there's no direct link between MTSU and Nathan Bedford Forest. It is purely out of um, lost cause mythology. That's what it is. It's to intimidate black people in the South during the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, one of the other questions which I already raised was maybe the. Can more broadly the connections between how other nations have handled these issues like Germany? Uh, are there lessons uh, more broadly uh, for us in the South? If anyone has a thought on that. 
my real basic thoughts on that, because I'm, I'm not a scholar of German social studies history in any way, <laughs> not going to pretend, but what I do tangentially know is that um, the, what happened during World War II, what happened in the Holocaust and the persecution of various minority groups, they're honest about it. It goes back to what Josh was saying. We're not honest in America about our past in any way. Um, in a, in a systematic way, you know, K through 12 education is a highly political standard that they get taught. Textbooks are created in a highly political environment. Um, so we're all kind of being fed a specific American exceptionalism, American dream narrative that is a lie. And we're just not being honest. And whereas you can see in other countries, they're a lot more honest about what they did. Um, how they were oppressive in the past and they put in in place certain laws and specifically in Germany where you cannot you know it's illegal to do a Nazi salute you cannot have up Nazi symbols whereas what do we do here in America the confederate flag is just heritage not hate it's everywhere um so yeah that's those are my comments on that I, that's as much as I know about Germany and what they teach in their schools but there are definitely some lessons to be learned perhaps Uh, another, um, someone had also asked, just to remind us, the issue of military bases, um, uh, you know, if, if there's a particular uh, uh, observation among the panelists on that, perhaps. Um, uh, also, um, there's another question that I haven't posed, which is, um, how would Josh and Connor advise professors, faculty, directors of institutes uh, at, at institutions and the like harness their power to address these issues? Yeah, I think, um, you know, if, if we do, if we understand race as a, as a, a political force and not a, not a biological one, which as you're saying earlier, doesn't have a basis in, in biology, but rather as a way of sorting power. I mean, I think this is, this is true for professors or, for, you know, for anyone who, who's interested in doing this work, like, look where the power is. Um, and it didn't get that way by accident, you know. Um, we, we, we might be participating in some of these systems passively um, and conveniently sort of blind to how they're, they're playing out, but they are playing out and they're, they're, the people who, who have power don't have power by accident. Um, so, so vest power in, you seek to disrupt that system and vest power um, in ways that can lead to more equitable outcomes, racially, uh, you know, for, for, for queer students, you know, the, across the board, like this is, um, we, we haven't wound up here by accident. Um, and so I think naming it, seeing it, talking about it and, and, and seeking to, uh, challenge the power that it protects, I think, is um, is the work. Yeah, I've just been thinking about, um, you know, syllab syllabi lately, right? Like, especially for professors, um, you know, are you upholding the master narrative or are you disrupting it, right? Like, what's your version of history? You know, we have to become to understand that, you know, there's no one master version of history, right? There's multiple histories and, but are you teaching that master form of history, right? <laughs> are you teaching that Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves <laughs> at X, Y, Z, right? Um, or are we teaching about how people, you know, fought for freedom for themselves? Like, I think, you know, even our pedagogical strategies in the classrooms um, have to reflect the ways that we're disrupting power. Um, and that's also in the field of knowledge, right? That's it's, and especially history. Um, that's one of the ways we can disrupt this. Uh, Lewis, you had asked earlier about the uh, military bases in the South uh, being named after uh, Confederate generals, which I mean, on its face, is just a, <laughs> a massive betrayal of of the of, of one of the consequences of that war, which is that the you know. South seceded a sort of traitorous, um, a traitorous project. Um, but you, but I think you see uh, the historian David Blight talks about how there were there were two really um, main challenges after the war during Reconstruction. And the first was to sort of unite 
brother and brother, you know, the, the sort of white northerners and white southerners finding reconciliation. Um, and, and I think it's, it's convenient to try and interpret the military bases named uh, for Confederate generals in that way, like, oh, this was reunification. Um, of course, the, the other central project of, of Reconstruction was to vest um, full citizenship and political power in the formerly enslaved. Um, and of course, uh, Reconstruction shows the, the, the uh, strides taken in that direction. And then of course, redemption, the, the betrayal of that project and the, the reimposition of Jim Crow. Uh, and, and that's at the time when these Confederate monuments start to go up as the former Confederates return to power, re, you know, reimpose white supremacist laws, white supremacist organization of, of these towns and, and states and, and region. Um, they hoist monuments to their heroes and they, you know, start to name these, these bases after their heroes as well. And, and it's impossible not to interpret that as a... Um, uh, an insult, a, a form of intimidation, a reminder of status to black people in the towns where these bases were, were going up. Um, you know, the, uh, Henry Louis Gates has a great book, Stony the Road, that documents all of these, these images at the time coming after Reconstruction um, that, that fixed his argument, is that, you know, showing how it fixed in white American psyche even on this their deep level images of, of black inferiority and, and, and white sort of heroism. And, and, and we see that in the Confederate monuments, we see that in military bases named after, after Confederates. We see this in so many different ways that, you know, are such a visual culture and, and so much of that is meant to underpin a, a view of, of, of black Americans as inferior. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's all linked. This, this symbolic work has deep, you know, deep sort of psychological impacts too. Um, but yeah, it's not good. I know we're about to get off, but I would also just, you know, push folks to think about also, you know, military bases, the connection between military bases and the violence of the Confederacy, right? Like this is like the connections on one hand don't make any sense, but the connections on the other hand make total sense um, of how the Confederacy and America and these bases and the military are all tangled up in this war machine that has not stopped <laughs> since America has been a country. There's one last, uh, uh, somebody has been waiting patiently for a, a question that has a quick answer, and this might best be answered by Sarah. Uh, someone's asked about the medallion, the forest medallion that hung on the KUC and how it seemed to have disappeared. Uh, this would have been maybe 30 years ago. And if you, that is, story is told in our Movement 68 video, uh, but Sarah, if you could share that briefly. Yeah, so um, by 1989, uh, students formed an NAACP student chapter on campus, and Vincent Windrow, who some of you probably know because he works on campus in student success, um, he was the leader of the NAACP student chapter, and first thing they did that fall semester in 89 was um, right into the sidelines where a lot of this stuff happens. A lot of black students over time, you know, go straight to sidelines, put out a letter or something, and that starts a debate on campus. So they said, you know, what's up with this, this medallion on the KUC, the student union at the time, the only student union, so that's where everyone's gathering, right? Why does it make sense to have such a racist symbol where black students and brown students have to be? Um, and from my understanding from Vincent, that there was kind of a back and forth for a couple of weeks. And um, he tells me, tells, he tells a story way better than I do, by the way. So go watch Movement 68 on our YouTube channel. But he gets a call towards the end of semester, right before we break for Christmas, uh, or winter break, excuse me. And I think it was from president at the time, Sam Ingram. And he said, you know, just I have, a I have an early Christmas present for you. Go, go see the KUC. Um, and the medallion was gone. Um, President Ingram, after listening to Black students' grievances and the injustices they have experienced on this campus, he decided to just take it down, not ask anyone's public opinion, not ask white people what they wanted to do. He just said, this is a problem that has come up time and time again. It's a problem. It's being you know, brought to my attention now, and he just decided to take it down. So that story is actually a really good example of someone higher power on this campus just going straight to the core issue and just dealing with it without all this, 
without what, as Josh refers to it, without debating white supremacy. We don't need to debate it. He was like, no, I'm just going to take it down. And it did cause a lot of controversy when people came back from winter break. A lot of white people were upset for years. Um, MTSU was still getting letters from the Sons of, Confeder uh, Sons of Confederate Veterans, United Dodgers of the Confederacy, till about 1993 is the last one that's in our archive at least. But MTSU stuck with the precedent that the president set and they said, we're not bringing it back. It's gone for good. And am I remembering correctly that it's at, it's at the state park now? It is. The Hartford Forest State Park. Yes. Which is, I think, a more appropriate place. Um, or I was asked recently in a news, <laughs> in a news story, you know, where do I think as an archivist historian these Confederate monuments should go? And I said, you know, some place where these Confederate groups still exist, you know, they have their own land or their own property like these state parks. Or I said that they should go in the trash. And I definitely stand by that statement to this day. <laughs> they don't belong in museums or archives because they will not be interpreted properly. There's still too, uh, there's too much tension still that it'll be misinterpreted in a oppressive way. So they just need to be gone. And that's there's, a, uh, there's a Confederate museum coming soon. Uh, I think it was supposed to open in May, but it had to be pushed because of the pandemic. But yeah, I think they're, I, I, maybe it, it's near his uh, birthplace over toward Chapel Hill, I think. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, th and I think there'll be a repository for a lot of these statues. I think the one from Memphis is, will wind up there eventually. Um, yeah, so <laughs> we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll be back here soon to talk about it. Oh yeah. Well, I just want to thank all the attendees for coming. I want to thank Josh and Connor and Sarah for their wise comments and engaging uh, discussion. I want to thank uh, Donna Baker, who's a university archivist, who's been uh, sharing some of the uh, specific exhibits in the chat. So please take a note of those. And um, again, just thank you all. This has been just wonderful. I really, I'm really grateful. Y'all, good night. <laughs>